Friends, our teacher, Rabbi Larry Hoffman, wrote of this night. Tonight we face our nakedness, mirrored contemplations of concealed selves laid bare of artifice. This is the time when consciousness colludes with conscience to shatter the delusions with which we cloak our souls. Tonight, God asks us who and what we are. Yes, this is the night of truth. It's a night of vulnerability. I don't mean the physical kind of vulnerability, natural disasters, disease, violence. Not the vulnerability of the body, but vulnerability of the soul. Our society teaches us, shows us that we're supposed to be successful and accomplished and perfect. So we wear masks to play the part. We wear the mask of busyness. How often this year have you said to someone, I'm so busy, or you up the ante, I'm crazy busy. <laughs> we think that if we make ourselves busy enough, the truth of our lives won't catch up to us. And we wear the mask of perfection. We think if we're perfect, then we will be liked. Isn't this what social media is for? Everybody's having their best day ever. <laughs> and now there are filters to make you younger and cooler and more attractive than you already are. I know we live in the age of the superhero, folks, but I have news for you. They're a myth. There's no human being without flaws. In fact, that is what makes us most human. And yet we wear the mask of achievement too. We feign confidence and bravado. We think we need to know all the answers. We're desperate to hold on to status or position. And we constantly value test scores and dollar signs over the pursuit of our dreams. Oh, we're good at avoiding all of this. We use humor and sarcasm to avoid insight. We sedate ourselves with alcohol and drugs to avoid emotion. We spend money to feel good, at least for the moment. In truth, we should be spending our days not hiding our truths from ourselves and others. We should not be hiding our self-doubt, our failure, our fear, our heartbreak, our loneliness, our truth. We each fear that we are unworthy. We fear hurt and rejection. We fear we won't be liked. We want acceptance. So we contort ourselves to fit exactly into this perfect little box. And we tell ourselves, if only we can do that, then we will be loved. The truth is that we desperately want to be known and loved for exactly who we are. The truth is that we desperately want to live with authenticity. The truth is that we long for genuine connection. The box or the prayer book invites us to strip away the whole facade on this night. In words that we will soon read, we say, we are not so arrogant and stiff-necked as to maintain this veneer of perfection before you, God. So tonight, let's unburden ourselves. Let's move beyond fear and shame 
into vulnerability. Because vulnerability, we know, will enable us to live with authenticity, to connect with others, to grow, and to accomplish our dreams. All too often, we avoid vulnerability with our friends. We say, I'm good, family's fine, work's all right. What is friendship if not an invitation to authenticity? How many of us have spent two hours over dinner discussing only trivialities? Sometimes with our families, but more often with friends on a Saturday night. We talk about Netflix and sports and our pets. And friends, even talking about our kids is a shield because the more we talk about our kids, the less we have to talk about ourselves. We want to share our struggles and our doubts, our dreams and our aspirations. Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, who passed away this year said, one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody is the gift of your honest self. That is truly the gift of friendship. This spring, out of the blue, a very close friend gave me a call. He lives far away. We hadn't seen each other in more than two years, but he was in the area and he asked if he could come for a visit. Of course, I was thrilled. We sat down and we started to talk. He told me how he was proud that he had accomplished much in the past decade or so of his career but that he was now exhausted from traveling internationally. He said, I've stayed in enough ho nice hotels and eaten in plenty of fancy restaurants. I don't want to do it anymore. He feared that he was growing distant from his wife and he was missing too much of his kids' lives. He shared that he was trying to embrace the vulnerability of creating a new beginning making a transition. It was the most authentic and treasured conversation that I had with a friend all year. Maybe you had one of your own like that, over a stiff drink or coffee, on the golf course or the tennis court, driving, or maybe just on the phone. I hope you treasured it. We avoid vulnerability too with our children. One time this summer, Haley and I were at dinner with another couple and they told us that the following day they were expecting a phone call from their kids at sleepaway camp. And they said, we just have to remember we're not allowed to tell them that we miss them. <laughs> I didn't understand. They said, well, the camp doesn't want them to feel bad. God forbid. <laughs> How often do we say that we just want our children to be happy? So we shield them from emotion, from struggles, and we do this not only with little ones, we do this with our adult children too. We create the false illusion that life proceeds in a straight line from enjoyment to enjoyment, from success to success, with no deviation from that path. It's like we all live in Garrison Keillor's fictional Lake Wobegon. Many of you know the line, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. <laughs> Researcher Brene, Brene Brown writes about parenting. The mandate is not to be perfect and raise happy children. Perfection doesn't exist. 
What makes happy children doesn't always prepare them to be courageous and engaged adults. I've been impressed, friends, with the vulnerability that I've seen from time to time within the Temple Israel men's group. I know that it happens in the women's group too. One evening late this summer over beers, one congregant shared the story that he had just come back from dropping his son for his freshman year of college. He got all the stuff into the dorm room. Dad got back into the car and he cried for 20 minutes straight. That prompted another nearby to share that that day had been his children's first day of kindergarten. He'd seen them off at the bus. And as the bus pulled away, he too cried. We cry for many reasons, for gratitude at having reached a new stage safely, healthily. We cry at sadness for the passage of time, knowing that for some of us, the days ahead of us are outnumbered by the days in the rearview mirror. I'm so glad that we've created certain spaces where people feel, feel comfortable sharing here in our congregation. What would it feel like if you were able to step into vulnerability with your children of any age and share with them how you're truly feeling? It seems to me that our bonds of connection that we treasure so much would grow even stronger. And friends, we avoid vulnerability with our spouses. Under the chuppah, we commit to unconditional love and acceptance. Too often, we evade and avoid. We deflect and defer. There are conversations that we desperately want to have, each one of us. But we put it off. And so silence reigns. Distance grows. We withhold affection. We feel alone. We feel alone in the one relationship where we're supposed to feel together. Brene Brown writes, there is no intimacy without vulnerability. Could a step into vulnerability reveal, uncover, the loving and fulfilling relationship that we all know is there, that we all dream of each day. Surely it's right in front of us, and we can do it. And we avoid vulnerability with our parents. Some of our parents are aging, facing struggles with their health, and we struggle to walk the line, too, between celebrating their independence and wanting to step in to manage their affairs. Should we share our worry and concern, we wonder? Surely we should at least share our gratitude that, for example, we can still sit with them and celebrate holidays with them as we are doing tonight, so many of us. We avoid vulnerability at work. We're trained to do what we do, and for most of us, we do it well. We could continue on the same path that we're on and have a decently successful career, but what would it feel like to step into vulnerability in order to grow? I started my career as a rabbi at large and prestigious congregations. And I worked for highly respected rabbis, and they always thought, or so they told me, that I was doing a great job. And then I worked for Rabbi Peter Rubenstein. And after a little while working together, Peter, to his eternal credit, said, you think you're a good rabbi, 
You're not. <laughs> you could be. If somehow we can address your insecurities and your shortcomings, then you might get there. That was a tough conversation. <laughs> but it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I was fortunate to have a mentor like Peter who was willing to push me into vulnerability for my own benefit. Maybe you've had a mentor like that. Or maybe you've been a mentor to someone. Maybe there are other places we can enter vulnerability in our work, in our career. After all, we, so many of us feel like we're running faster and faster only to drop farther behind. But we don't talk about feeling trapped in a job, talk about the burden of our commute or the fear of being replaced by someone younger and cheaper. Sometimes we have to have the vision and fortitude to step into vulnerability on our own. I'm very proud of my wife, Haley, who in the past year and a half has become a tech entrepreneur. Daily, she overcomes uncertainty and fear and failure, as many of you who have started your own businesses know all too well. She's pursuing her dream. What could be better? Friends, for most of the Torah, we, the Jewish people, are wandering in the desert. We're beset by vulnerability, hunger and thirst and plague and marauding tribes. And time and again, we want to go back to Egypt. We prefer the misery of slavery because there, at least we had a roof over our heads and we had regular rations. But God commands us never to go back, only to move forward farther into the desert, farther into vulnerability. That's the only way we can get to the promised land. Even the greatest among us have been pushed into vulnerability. Moses encounters God for the first time at the burning bush. God tells him, go free our people. And he offers, Moses offers excuse after excuse. I can't speak well. No one will listen. Please send someone else, God, he says. In reality, Moses is afraid, afraid of rejection and failure. How does God get Moses to go forward? Well, God steps into vulnerability, God's self. God reveals what up to then has been the secret divine name. Only then does Moses begin his mission and is able to fulfill his potential. So tonight, friends, I challenge us to be vulnerable for there is fertility in vulnerability. It's the only way to build authentic relationships. It's the only way to grow. I've seen the fertility of vulnerability firsthand. I've sat with a daughter as she reveals the story behind her mother's estrangement. I've sat with a widow as she shares her struggle to mourn her husband. I've sat with a father as he divulges his son's battle with addiction. I've sat with a bar mitzvah boy who confides sheepishly that he doesn't believe in God and that he's afraid to disappoint his parents. I've sat with a wedding couple who is finally able to discuss the roots of conflict in their relationship. These are moments of authenticity and growth and connection. And if those moments are possible, they're impossible for any of us. And I would suggest tonight that vulnerability might even be the antidote to society's poisonous and polarized political discourse. How many of us have been to a wedding where guests are assigned to different tables based on their political affiliation? <laughs> God forbid we should come into contact with someone whose opinion makes us uncomfortable. We hide behind the mask of our own ideology. 
We dismiss the opposite side as crazy or callous or soft without even talking to them. And we reiterate the same arguments to ourselves, to our friends, reinforcing our sense of self-righteousness. What would it feel like to talk with openness with those with whom you might not agree? Could vulnerability be the antidote to our society's toxic anger? In truth, friends, we already know the value of vulnerability, but it's intimidating. Let's imagine a few ways we might take that step into vulnerability. First, we might ask for help when we need it. We are good at seeing when others need help. You know how this community has provided for you at a time of need when you've had to sit shiva or you've been ill. One congregant shared with me, just when I think I need to soldier on and get through this rough patch without asking for help, I am reminded that I don't have to carry the world on my shoulders alone. And another congregant who suffered a traumatic loss this year said, I've learned to ask for help. I've also seen others only now willing to share the not so pretty side of their lives. Perhaps now that this woman is in a vulner vulner vulnerable space, her friends are finally willing to share their own vulnerability with her. But friends, it should not take a trauma of this sort in order to be vulnerable. Let's build the loving and fulfilling relationships we desire. Let's have the conversation we know we want to have, even if it may be difficult. Let's share with openness. Let's choose connection over silence and distance. Let's move beyond the trivial into authenticity in our friendships. Call the trusted friend you haven't seen or spoken to in a while, or be the friend who asks, no, 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 how are you? Cultivate a relationship that makes you feel inspired and creative and brave. And let's connect with our children. My father-in-law, Ira, who passed away this year, used to ask, how's your heart? It was not just the words, but the way he asked it that formed the most wonderful invitation to share. And let's grow at work too. Take time to mentor someone with potential. Reconnect with an old mentor with, from the past who has brought out the best in you. Or perhaps this is the year that you will take the leap into the unknown, pursuing your own dreams. On this night of truth, let us find opportunities to share the most authentic parts of ourselves. <coughs> Let's access our vulnerability to make the change in our relationship, in our career, in ourselves that we seek. In this new year, let us each find ways to live with authenticity, to truly connect with others, to grow, to achieve our dreams. For only when we're brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. May it be so.